Welcome to Financial Plan and Explained. I'm your host, Mike Menninger, founder and owner of Menninger & Associates Financial Planning. I'm a certified financial planner, and I am also uh, here with Kyle Ryan, uh, one of my leading advisors, who is also a certified financial planner as well as a chartered financial consultant. Kyle, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, as always, the purpose of the show is to provide an educational experience, um, talking about different topics uh, associated with financial planning, financial planning explaining. Hey, guess what? We're trying to talk, teach you on financial planning. So if you really look at the six different areas of financial planning, you got cash management, tax planning, risk management, investment planning, retirement planning, and estate planning. And what we're going to do today is we're going to go through a case study um, that gets involved in a lot of retirement. I could check every darn box. <laughs> Almost every single client checks every box. I mean, really, if, if, if we're doing our job the way we should be doing our job, yep. we should be touching and checking every box, which we do. It just so happens that it probably covers that one more. Now, we're going to go through a case study today. We've had a lot of uh, great reviews, uh, feedback from our viewers saying, hey, we love these case studies because sometimes it applies to them. Now, let me also point out as a full disclosure as it pertains to this case study it's sort of a case study i mean basically what happens is i like the old basf commercials we don't make these we just make them better well i have a horrible ability to be creative and just develop something so what we do is we take a case that seemingly touched on a bunch of different things we change a few things and so on and so forth. We, we throw out things that didn't matter and we add things that might touch upon. And all it is is really the case study is simply serving as a foundation of providing opportunities to talk about different topics that we bump into in a typical case. It's like a nonfiction movie. It's based loosely on real events. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I actually saw one not too long ago. It was pretty good. So I tell you what, you ready to go? We're going to talk about Mark and Nancy. All right. Kyle, I'll let you fire it off. All right. Yeah. So we got Mark and Nancy here. Again, based loosely on real events. So Mark and Nancy, uh, Mark is 61 years old. His wife, Nancy, is 60. Mark is still working, making roughly $300,000 a year. Nancy, however, retired. She is collecting a pension right now. Mark uh, also has the ability to collect a pension in the future once he retires, but Nancy is collecting now. Both of their sets of parents, this is going to be one of the crux of the issues, both of their sets of parents passed away. Um, one more recently, after 2020, which is important, and we'll get to it later, one prior to 2020, so they have different distribution rules there. So um, pretty straightforward from the facts here. Um, so, you know, we came to the two of them, um, or they came to the two of us with some questions for us, you know. Recently, Mark's parents had passed away. He's now got an inheritance, and it made them rethink, you know, we didn't really do much with Nancy's parents' inheritance, so how do we make sure that, in, in their words, how do we make sure we're not doing anything stupid, right? Yeah, we, I remember right? saying, well, why are you here? We want to yeah. make sure that we don't do anything it's, stupid. So I love it. Not <laughs> quite the way I would have phrased it, but I can understand uh, you know, it, right? It's you don't want for to them do anything. Hey, exactly. We, <laughs> we don't want to do anything wrong, right? So we want to make sure that they're well advised, making well informed decisions here. So, what are some of the questions that both they brought to us and we brought to them after analyzing them a little bit, right? The other thing that comes into play is people always ask, well, they don't even have to ask about taxes. I think we have a reputation of being, you know, as financial advisors, yeah. as a firm, as one of the most tax savvy. Yeah. And, and we focus on taxes because, you know, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. And, and taxes, while tax planning has its own section of the, you know, the six areas of financial planning, quite frankly, it's the one that really delves into each of them in its own unique way. Right, and, and you and can't get away with it. No, you, you can't. You can't you know. get away from it. And so, again, any way with which, you know, we can improve tax efficiency, they may not always be coming in asking for it, but guess what? You deal with us, you're going to get it. And <laughs> again, it's not how much yeah. you make, it's how much you keep. And, yep. if, and it's remarkable you know, how much money people can save yeah. over time. Yeah, and people are incentivized. by it. I've never heard someone who said that they wanted to pay more taxes. Oh, yeah, absolutely, because <laughs> they know full well the government's going to spend it extremely well. Very well. And then the obvious question that we always get, mm -hmm. can I retire? Yes. 
Yeah, of course. Well, you can retire, but it's more of, do I have enough? Yeah. That's what they mean by yes. it. Yes, do, do I have, I have enough to retire? to retire? How much do I need to retire? So, so you know, going back here is, what are some of the questions specifically that they had asked us, right? Here? Right. So, you know, looking at the slide here, it's, you know, their inheritance. We mentioned that they have an inheritance. Not only do they have an inheritance, they have two sets of different inheritance from different sets of parents, right. Mark and Nancy's, effectively that have four. effectively four. Good point. That have different rules. All four of them essentially have different rules because of when their parents passed away. And okay. by the way, I will have you know, as long as I've been doing this, mm -hmm. and as many people as I've met, yeah, they came up with two things I've never seen before. Okay, and I, I know what one of them is. Again, yeah. of the inherited Roth. Yes, inheriting an inherited Roth. Oh, okay, it actually, then the other one was the spouse took over an IRA <clears throat> as an inherited IRA yes. and not as their own. Yes. I've never so, seen that happen. Yes. And, <laughs> yes, so this is a really interesting one. That's why we picked it. So, well, you know, it's, yep. it's just, you know, stuff comes up. And that's yes. why we always say experience is it's unmatched because of the fact that, you know, Granted, I don't come across new things all that often. So when I come across a couple of them in the same time, that's even more. But, you know, it, this is exciting because what this enables us to do is really help guide the clients. And the, the, the great part about these clients is they're both extremely sophisticated. Yeah. yeah it's just absolutely. that they're not familiar with some of the tools and everything else associated with financial planning. Absolutely. And that's yeah. why they sought our assistance. Absolutely. And knowledge is power, right? So the, the, going back just again to cover just the main questions that come again with their own sets of issues, if you will, but sticking on the questions is one, how do we inherit, handle the inheritance that we have received? Two, with handling that, how do we pay the taxes on it? And they're each taxed in a different way um, and, and, and with which how they and have are to. they taxed? And are they taxed? Right. That's another very good question, right? So given that once some are taxed, some may not be taxed, what is the most efficient way that we can handle this from a tax perspective? And then the question on everyone's mind when they come in, do they have enough money to retire? Is it okay if I slow down work? Can I stop entirely? Because it's, okay. it's really powerful that you know, when you're going to work and you love what you do, you're going because you want to, not because you have to. Right. Right. So that's always something that's, that's on, on people's mind as they approach retirement. So, Given these questions, let's talk about some of the issues. Because well, whenever, so, yeah, they ask yeah. the questions, and typically what we do is, is we go and say, all right, well, great. What are your goals, objectives, et cetera? Now let's dive in. Yes. Okay, yes. we let's do the discovery, and let's, yep. you know, let's, let's get all the information, which they were extremely organized yes. and had all of it. And even when they gave all of it to us, it was not so much complex, but a lot of stuff yes there's there's a lot of uh dupl duplicate types of accounts duplicity du duplicity <laughs> duplicate types of accounts there's word. things there's things that you know at the end of the day as complicated as all of this may seem that what we try and do is make it seem simple right? right and that's that's ultimately one of the solutions that we had for them so given everything that we understand so far we we raised some questions of our own you know we, we call them issues here right so let's talk about some of the issues all these years that they've been making, you know, as we mentioned, Mark was making three hundred thousand dollars. Nancy was in the same similar range. All of their contributions have been going to pre-tax accounts. The traditional, right? the traditional four hundred one k's. That's IRAs, now, you know, they're rolling it out to IRAs. And if you've ever watched one of Mike's episodes in the past, is that this could be a ticking time bomb, if you will, because we are at the lowest tax bracket system we've been in since World War II. It's anticipated that will go up. As we previously explained, it could negatively impact your Social Security, your Medicare. Your, uh, right, all that right. stuff. Okay. So everything. And, so, and right. inheritance. Yes. Because herein lies one of those examples that we're going to talk about, yep. the runaway train. Yes. Yep. And it, the runaway train, effectively, the major beneficiary of the runaway train is the federal government. It always is. Don't and let the government be one of your primary beneficiaries. Exactly. Right? And by the way, they're in that position. And, and when we raise it to their attention, when we first met with them, yep. you know, you don't know what you don't know. We're not intentionally trying to scare people. We're certainly not trying to do that. It's a challenge when you have these situations because, you know, tax mitigation is going to result in paying taxes. Just we're trying to pay less. Yes, and it's not always the easiest it's pill to the, swallow today to recognize the long-term benefits, which may at this point be intangible. Right? And so, think. yeah, and exactly. And so what happens here is you know, let's take someone who's married and makes $300,000. This is such a common misnomer. 
people are saying, and this is why so many people we run into who are reasonably wealthy have a whole potload of money in their 401k and their pre-tax assets because intuitively, if you're making 300 grand and you say, when I retire, I am making nothing, you must be in a lower income tax bracket when you're making nothing. Yep. Guess what? They're a perfect example of someone who's in a higher tax bracket when they retire than they are today. And not only because of pensions, but another thing that we've mentioned in the past is when you have IRAs and you pass away, the people who inherit your IRA, unless it's a spouse, which is also kind of tricky for this one, but if you leave your IRA to a child, for example, they have 10 years now, given the new rules post-2020. Non-spouse IRA, not even a child, just yep, non-spouse IRA. Non but, IRA yeah. but yeah, you have 10 years to withdraw it. So if you leave a sizable inherited IRA to one person, who's already making a decent chunk of money from either work or when they're retired and they're collecting pensions, then you make them take it all out in 10 years, that could really bump yeah. you up in the tax brackets. And yep. once again, the government's gonna benefit from that. Right, so you know, rule of thumb mm -hmm. is that if you were to take a pot of money and divide it evenly across 10 years with some level of growth, let's say five or 6% growth, yeah. that you actually have to take 15% of it yep. per year. In other words, if you had a million dollars okay, or $100,000, whatever, $100,000, and you have to take it out over 15 years, 15% 15 of 100,000 is 15,000 a year for 10 years. Yep. That's not gonna push you over the top. We're not worried about that. But we come across it at times where people have a couple million dollars, okay, and you're having to take 50, and you got one child, yep. which is the case here, yep. okay? $2 million, 15% of $2 million is $300,000 a year, okay? You throw $300,000 a year of taxable income onto somebody, and if you take the normal life expectancy of people that are in their 80s, their children are in their 50s in their highest earning income years. Hey, kid, I love you so much. I'm going to give you this pot of money. And oh, by the way, you got to pay taxes on it. Yep. Okay. And not a small amount of taxes. And not either. a small amount of taxes. And what, what enables people to go, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to worry about it. Well, yeah, you know what? These are your family assets. Okay, let's make it so that the federal government is gonna have their hand in your pocket. Let's let them not take as much out as possible. Yes. Whether it's during your lifetime or theirs, and even during your lifetime, you're still gonna be ahead of the game. Yep. Okay. Yep. So and one, and one last issue on this is it's not. I wouldn't even consider this an issue because we're we're in a unique environment for the last 20 years in which you can actually make money on cash. So um, so for this example, um, for these these two is that they have a you know, substantial amount of money sitting in the bank, whether it's in a money market account, a CD account. But the issue, if you will, is it's causing ordinary income. Right? Not it's, to mention it was earning diddly squat. That, okay, that's actually a good point. It, wasn't, <laughs> or it actually wasn't earning as much. Um, the CDs were doing a little bit better, but yes, they're, they're, but they're not earning But a lot of their money much. was just in savings yes. and, and, and the high yield money high markets. High yield, yield money market. Money market. Yeah, you getting half a percent. Out, you find know, 0.35%. <laughs> like, okay, that's a high yield. Well, it was higher than it was, but holy smokes. Yeah, what's yep. 0.35? You know, today's money markets are getting 5.35. Yes. Yep. Okay, and so, you know, if you take even, let's just say, in their case, they had like $300,000 or possibly more just in savings. But even if you took 100,000, the difference of 5% is over $400 a month in interest. You take five, that is a lot of money to be given away. It sure is. And oh, by the way, to your point, it is taxed as ordinary income. Yes. Which factors into all of the tax planning issues and the tax planning strategies that we try to employ for our clients. Yep. Uh, is it, do you want me to keep going? Good time yeah. to go on a break? Uh, keep going? Keep going. Okay, I'll keep going. So we just we touched on all the issues. And uh, so let's, let's talk about some of the things that we brought up, some of the other topics of discussion here. So one of the things that I mentioned, one of the solutions is you got, you got accounts all over the place, right? Now, we're not showing a balance sheet here. But one of the things is, you know, they have, you know, three different IRAs, a couple old 401ks, oh my they've goodness. got non-qualified accounts at seven different financial institutions. So first and foremost, if you have three IRAs that all act the exact same way, you've got a couple non-qualified accounts, make your life simple. They Combine had a balance sheet that was two pages. Two pages, and it did two not pages can be a good thing or it can be unnecessary. Right, okay, and, right? and this fell under the unnecessary. Un unnecessary, Because correct. you know what, I mean, you look at the days that people were, you know, oh, you know what, they got a special teaser rate, and I'm going to put my money into this bank. The next thing you know, uh, and we've got clients like this, they have like 15, yep. 20 Still. accounts. Yep. They're kind of the same way, not as bad as I've seen, but they've got a lot, 
and it's not necessary. Yeah. You know, if you have a bank that you use all the time, absolutely. You, do, you ought to have, but you don't need to have five different bank accounts. No, five and it's different and it's, banks. And also, it's one thing for yourself to have to handle all those different bank accounts. God if forbid you, you die. God forbid you pass away That's and you correct. didn't keep enough information, or just the person handling your estate now has to do it. Oh, my goodness. Right? That's, yeah. it's, it could oh, be, it's, it could it's be, a hassle. Yeah, and you don't want that for your beneficiaries, I'm sure. So we're going we're gonna to take a break here. Yes. All right. Okay. Good. So uh, we'll be back with you in just a few minutes. We're going to pick up the topics of discussion and then we'll flow through with some of the ideas and things along that nature. So stay tuned, we'll be back with you in just a few moments. Do you keep up regularly with your investments? Where exactly are your hard-earned dollars going? Are you financially prepared for an emergency? I'm Mike Menninger, founder of Menninger & Associates Financial Planning. We believe that education and knowledge are powerful, and we want our clients to understand why we are making the recommendations that we make. It's your money, and you deserve to know where it's going, because it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. So call us today to discuss your financial concerns. Welcome back to Financial Plan and Explained. I'm Mike Menninger, the host, and I'm with Kyle Ryan. We're gonna pick up where we left off. So you know, here we got, someone comes into us and you know they have stuff all over the place and, and thinking about retiring soon, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the kind of the topics that we felt we needed to, they had their issues or questions, what can we do to help them with their goals and objectives? We dive in, we take a look at their stuff, and we immediately recognized three basic things. One is simplification and consolidating of their assets, which is what we talked about. Yep. The second thing we looked at is, um, the next things we were looking at were tax planning considerations. Okay, Keith? Tax planning considerations. And then lastly, we were dealing with estate planning considerations. So with the tax planning came uh, a few different things. Like we, we talked about that all their money in pre-tax. Yes. Okay, and we're just like, oh my goodness. Um, if you show the next slide, please. The issues were, hey, holy cow, how do we maximize tax efficiency and, et cetera, et cetera. And one thing is, while we're, while we're getting on this note is, one thing we were able to determine, you know, after a couple of discussions with them is, you know, the question, are we okay to retire? We were able to put that one to bed pretty quickly. It's like, yes, you know, you're okay to retire. You're going to have enough money to live on. So let's focus on these three other right. things that are really important to you. Let's clean up, clean up the house, consolidate. Let's make sure that the government is one of your primary beneficiaries, both from today tax planning and tax planning and for the future, That's as correct. well as setting up your estate. Right. right. So I just wanted to exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so yeah, we it's now we blew off the other thing. We're yep. just kind of consolidating. And the purpose of some of these other topics, where they they present themselves with ideas for discussion. Okay. So we've talked about Roth conversions. Basically, a Roth conversion is taking your IRA money moving it over to a Roth, paying the taxes today at the lower rate, and then allowing it to grow tax-free for the rest of your life. Now, what we talked about in the first segment, when you have a whole pot load of money sitting there that's retirement assets, you have required minimum distributions. Yes. Okay, which depending on your age, it's going to either be age 72, 73, or 75. Now it's either 73 or 75. But basically, that means you have to start taking money out of your IRAs to the tune of about 4% to start based upon your age and life expectancy. It's based on the value of your assets. But what happens, and we talked about this, is that if you have a giant amount of assets and then you've got pensions and everything else, next thing you know, you have a lot of income coming in in retirement, yes. which then means that you're potentially running into higher tax brackets at retirement when you, need, when you have to take the money out. Then you're running into issues of, you have too much income, now your Medicare premiums are going up. And then my, of course, uh, conspiracy theory is, do they ever decide to means test Social Security? If they ever decided to means test Social Security and you have all this other money coming in, you run the risk of having your Social Security to go down. That's a conspiracy theory of mine, but I don't think it's too far-fetched, yep. all right? So the other aspects that, you know, they didn't come in and ask, is one of the things that we identify when we meet with clients. They don't realize they have a tax issue. They don't realize they have long-term tax planning issues, the potential of IRMA and the higher tax bracket at retirement. You know, we show them how it works. You know, education is our product, right? So we like to teach. 
And then the other thing that we brought to their attention was estate planning. And estate planning took on a whole lot of heads. The first one was, holy smokes, looking at their estate, we were concerned about, to their one child, holy cow, we're gonna be handing a whole lot of money off. Yep. And oh, by the way, if they both died in a plane crash or a car crash tomorrow, yep. do you really wanna be dropping three or four million dollars onto your 21 year old? Yes. All right, not a I wise Emphasize move. that 21 year old. Right, exactly, <laughs> right? okay. So that is an estate planning issue of its own. But let's also talk about estate planning issues that we had as it pertains to their assets yes. that they received because this made it tricky. Yes. Because they had different things going on. So to your point earlier, if you have Secure Act that came out in 2019, okay, which basically made it effective January 1st of 2020. And one of the things was if someone died prior to the 2020 and there were a non-spouse beneficiary, what happened is if I received an IRA, let's say, from my mother, she yep. passes away, I receive an IRA, and it was prior to 2020, well, I have to take a little bit out every year in the form of a required minimum distribution. Not the exact same calculations, but conceptually similar to my own. Yep. But if she died after 2020, to our point where we were talking about, they have to take it within 10 years. Correct. Yep. Okay. So now they're receiving IRAs that are inherited, yep. some of which were from prior to 2020, which have their own RMDs. Yep. Then we have death after 2020, which has its 10-year RMD, yep. and then the inherited Roth. Yes. Okay. Which the rules were ambiguous coming into, uh, I think it was June of this year, the, the IRS finally um, uh, ruled on it that there was a question as if I inherited a Roth, do I have to take an RMD in years one through 10? And the answer to that question was finally, the, if the IRS finally answered that question in June of this year, June of 2023, and they said, the Beneficiary must be taken an RMD in years one through nine. And basically all the money has to be out by year 10. You could wait until year 10 to take all the money out, or you could take it along the way, whichever you choose to do. But if the person who died, the decedent, was taking RMDs, then I need to take them. On a okay? Roth? But there are no. Not on a Roth, oh, okay? Because if you think okay. about it, they weren't having to take an RMD on the Roth. Of course, yeah, there are no RMDs on your That's Roth. That's correct. Yep. Okay, so now we have, in our case, three different rules. We've got prior to 2020 IRAs that are now inherited again, but they were started it prior to 20, actually some IRAs were inherited prior to 2020. Therefore, they continue on with the old rules. Mm -hmm. Then the IRAs that were inherited now have the 10 year rule. And this is also where we found that the one parent inherited an IRA from their spouse and never took it as their own. So they had an inherited IRA of their own. Yes, it, Nancy had inherited an inherited IRA. I know. Roth IRA, which I've just never seen before. Exactly. Yeah. And now that even has different rules. Yes. <laughs> if it was inherited, if the first person died after 2020, yep. the 10 year time clock started at the beginning of that. Yes. So if it just so happens that, you know, I inherit an inherited IRA that was inherited in 21, then it's 10 years from 21. Yes. Okay. You're just picking it up. Right, I'm just picking up. So, and so I, we <laughs> ran into all kinds of cool things in this particular case. Yep. So. Again, we throw these case studies together because what it does is it provides cool things that you don't run into every day that I hope that it, it, it enables the, the, the viewer to say, hey, you know what, I had this or, or I can apply this or I can apply this to me somehow. Okay, so what else did we run into? Well, one of the other things that I thought was pretty nifty about this one is that the amount of inherited IRAs, the amount of inherited Roth IRAs, they have these required minimum distributions. They also have this tax problem of, of all these um, assets in pre-tax. So one of the solutions that we came up with um, was use the inherited IRA distributions that you know you have to take, you distribute those, 
not to yourself. To the tax. You send it right 100% right. to the IRS so that yep. it can help pay for your Roth conversions. You know you're taking the money anyway. You know you have a tax problem because you have too much in pre-tax assets. Use one problem to help the other problem. That's funny. Right? So, you know, and, and this is something that we routinely do with Roth conversions for clients who are taking a large Roth conversion. Okay. The Fed wants their money. Yep. Plain and simple. However, there are rules, and they have what's called safe harbor. That means you have to pay up to 90% of this year's tax or 110% of last year's blah, blah, blah. However, you know, like if you think about your pay stub, you're paying all through the year, okay? If you take an IRA distribution, you could pay the taxes at the end of the year from an IRA. Yep. Because when the government receives the money, then it's as if it was distributed the whole year. Now, what we've done before with clients is they'll do a $200,000 Roth conversion, okay, and they owe $50,000, for instance. So what we'll do is we'll convert $200,000 in January, mm -hmm. and then we wait until December to pay the IRS. Yep. Yo, we allowed a full year of growth, and now the IRS can have their well, money in December. It's like it was there the whole time. So this particular case, to your point, is we do Roth IRA conversions, and let's say, for instance, they have a $10,000 tax bill, but their inherited IRA miraculously has a $10,000 RMD. So what you do is you wait until the end of the year, you take your RMD from the inherited IRA, and you do 100% withholding to the federal government. So what are you doing? You're accomplishing your inherited IRA RMD, you're accomplishing getting the money to the government, and you're allowing that money to grow all the way up until the last minute during the course of the year. Yep. Now, again, this is all legal, nothing, nothing illegal, but hey, it's maximizing the rules. Allow the rules to work for you as opposed to you working for the rules. We're up against time here, so let's... Yep. Well, we, we already jumped into it, so we can just kind of talk about the final strategies that we have here. So one of the major strategies was converting these pre-tax assets to Roth. One of the additional ideas we added on was use the inherited IRA required minimum distributions to help pay for that tax. Another natural solution is, well, we've identified that Mark is still working and they have a growing problem in the pre-tax, so let's switch that to Roth, right? That's, that's an easy one for us. Um, those money market assets that we had mentioned earlier, the money market CDs, one idea that they could have, and it depends on their own risk tolerance and such, but you can buy what are called municipal bonds, which are not taxed at the federal level. Right, it could, it could lower that ordinary income tax for them. Um, as we mentioned, we, we suggested converting assets to Roth IRA from pre-tax. Um, the Social Security one's pretty interesting. So um, we suggest that Nancy begins collecting uh, Social Security at 62. Mark begins collecting Social Security at his full retirement age, which is 67. Mark had a higher salary. Right. Really quickly covering this strategy, and feel free to add on, is that the idea is that they don't need this money right now. That Social Security can basically be taken and be reinvested into the market at this point for Nancy's benefit because they don't need it. The break-even age, I believe, if you take it from 62 to your full retirement age is about 78. So yeah, so and then if you nice. invest it and you can just get a reasonable four or five percent like you can right now in market money market, it it's pushes that beyond, way well, beyond yeah. to the nineties, right. which their parents' longevity doesn't suggest that they'll get there. So the idea, and we covered that pretty quickly, but it's the idea is that if you don't need the money, may as well take it and let it grow. Besides which, if Mark dies, then guess what? Nancy just jumps right up to Mark's Social Security. Thank you. Yep. Exactly. All right. And so you know, there's just so many. And by the way, that that takes on its own head as far as Social Security <laughs> yeah, planning. So quick. you know, this was you know, a, a great, great uh, case because to use as an example, because it enabled us to touch upon a whole lot of different things that just about everyone out there hits one of these different things. Yes. Now, maybe not to an extreme yeah. like we encountered, but it was just a great opportunity to use this as an example. So once again, you know, it, it, the, it depends is the answer to every question. <laughs> the answer is everyone is unique, everyone is different. And so uh, I, I hope, you know, thank you for your time today and, and, and explaining. I hope you as the viewer received something and got something out of this. There are so many different things uh, careful what you read on the internet. It may not always necessarily be accurate. We run into that a lot. Um, but I would encourage you, if you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to us. You can check our website, www.maaplanning.com. Call us. Just, you know, I, I just encourage you to get professional help 
because you never know what you don't know. And trust me, at the end of the day, if you can save money, it's worth it. So uh, thank you for joining us, and I hope you had a, a great day and a great week, and we'll see you at the next episode.